Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Dan Davidson, President of the American Councils for International Education. The Councils is a leader in international education, academic exchange, and overseas language immersion programs that prepares individuals and institutions to succeed in an increasingly interconnected world. Dan has been Professor of Russian and Second Language Acquisition at Bryn Mawr College since 1983 and has generously agreed to share some of his insights with us. I'd like to thank you, Dan, for joining us today. Good morning. So, international language immersion is such an interesting topic given today's so often expressed idea that this is an, an English-only country. Talk about language immersion and the importance of language uh, to America, to the American economy, to America's influence in the world. The United States has benefited in some senses from the fact that the rest of the world has been keen to learn English over the last century. Uh, English is an important language of international communication, of science and research. And to that extent, it is easy for Americans to travel and maintain a certain level of engagement uh, with people in other parts of the world. Uh, that, in some sense, um, uh, is, is a limitation for Americans because there's a sense that somehow the rest of the world all speaks English anyway. And uh, to the extent that one has to do with uh, journalists and international hotels and CNN uh, around the world, one can get the impression that English might even be enough. So you uh, walk into almost any environment that, that one would typically encounter from an airport, you see the signs, to uh, walking into a hotel, um, interacting with taxi drivers, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. one is accustomed to being accommodated. Yes linguistically. Yes. And that's, that's really a very good way of putting it, that to the extent that Americans are willing to be accommodated around the world uh, by having others meet them halfway, uh, this uh, the, the English in some sense is, is helpful. And uh, English is probably enough to get by in many parts of the world. Uh, by the same token, if the goal of the overseas engagement for Americans is building trust, is, is uh, reaching agreement, is establishing rapport with people, of understanding not only how we see the world, but how they view the world, what their aspirations are, then it's very, very important that we get out of our own skins and that we somehow uh, uh, look at the world in, in, in other ways. That's, in a sense, that's the criticality of learning other people's languages. It's the enormous advantage that other foreigners have, uh, that is, that foreigners have in learning English, and that they are quite accomplished at times of understanding where we are as well as where they stand on issues. And that's an advantage for them, whether uh, it's a, with a commercial advantage, let's say, in marketing their products to, to us, or a strategic advantage in understanding better how to position themselves vis-a-vis -vis the United States from a, from a national security point of view. And what I think is so fascinating is that in these other countries, there's an economic incentive. People are not learning English mm -hmm. because it's a fascinating language, although it is. Mm -hmm. People are learning Eng English because it is of material impact in their lives. And so they invest in it from very, very early days. Now, what happens when the balance of economic power starts to shift? Mm -hmm and we have other dominant economies coming out and people just shift their investment into a different, the structures are already there, they shift their investment so that every taxi driver who is learning in, uh, English, mm -hmm. every person who's in the hospitality business who is learning English, every person who wants to drive international business deals is learning English, mm -hmm. now they start to shift mm -hmm. a bit. Mm -hmm. And we may be in a situation where because of our reticence about learning others, we might actually be disadvantaged, structurally disadvantaged. To totally agree with you. Uh, one of my colleagues who sp has spent decades uh, doing business in China says uh, uh, famously that uh, uh, English is quite enough in Chinese uh, to do business provided you only want to know what they want you to know. 
if you're negotiating uh, in a country, if you're competing with other providers, including Chinese as well as non-Chinese, then you, need, you, you really have to understand the underlying aspiration of your client. Maybe another way to put it is this, is this way, that uh, so long as uh, our only goal in this world is to purchase other people's products, then, then you as a client can be assured that the, the sellers will find a way to contact, uh, to be in touch with you. In the old, old uh, days of early, uh, the earliest forms of trade, there was something called vertical bilingualism, which meant that the, uh, uh, the, the growers and the herdsmen from high up in the mountains uh, would go down into the valleys to sell their products. Uh, now, in a case like that, the person doing the selling has to know the language of the client in the valley. Right. And in those cases, uh, all, the, all the mountaineers knew the language of the valley, whereas the, la the people in the valley didn't have to learn the language of the mountaineers. In a sense, that's a bit the situation now for English, that uh, so long as we just want to buy other people's produce uh, and products, uh, we're fine. Uh, the moment we want to sell, we need to understand their psychology. We have to understand what matters to them in this world and then find the right argumentation to collaborate with them, uh, to, to, sell our, to sell our products, as it were, or to sign treaties with those people uh, on the basis of uh, mutual um, uh, self-interest. And negotiating through a translator, with mm -hmm. all due respect to the great skill of, of mm -hmm. some of the uh, translators out there, uh, it's, it's like negotiating or, or cutting with a very blunt knife. Yes. You know, you, you basically are so disadvantaged yeah. in that, that the, that the sharp end is actually wielded by the person who has those linguistic skills. Absolutely, but that's a, that's a very, very helpful metaphor. And uh, a, a close friend and colleague of mine who was senior ambassador uh, for the United States to Moscow for mm -hmm. many years told me that arguably as a, a U.S. ambassador to Moscow, he had access and the services of the best translators that the United States or Russia could provide and he said, had he himself not been a high-level speaker of Russian, even with those translators, he would have missed about half of the critical information that came into him on all sides. This is just an example of your sharp knife in a case like that. So now the, the uh, economic forces in the world are realigning. Uh, China is definitely ascendant. Mm -hmm. uh, but beyond China, you have Brazil, you sure. have India, you mm -hmm. have the various uh, countries mm -hmm. that are reservoirs of entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. um, whether it's uh, manufacturing or uh, in various technologies, medical technologies yes. are becoming uh, mm -hmm. internationalized. Yes. So many of these economies through the last uh, years mm -hmm. have developed English speakers. Is it true that as the economy shifts, we're actually tipping into a greater area of disadvantage when it comes to those communication abilities that mm -hmm. our schools mm -hmm. um, uh, try to engender in, in our population. Isn't that increasingly an essential skill, just like the STEM skills? We talk about STEM skills, mm -hmm. science, technology, engineering, mm -hmm. and math, mm -hmm. and, and we, we focus there as if, as if that's the picture, and that's where our disadvantage lies. Aren't we missing language? I think we'd argue that it, just as, as science and technology were probably the defining movers of 20th century progress, uh, a lot of experts today would say that it's actually the humanities and communicative skills that are going to make the huge difference in 21st century uh, co the internet. collaboration. The internet, in the is, internet is, is, is all about communication and, and interconnection. Exactly. Communication, collaboration, and the establishment of contact. How, how, do you, how do you establish rapport with another person, uh, particularly in the internet environment, where it all comes down to words? Right. And uh, it's not so much the technologies are sort of there, they're moving very, very quickly, they're coming in from all sides. The question is, where do we fit into that, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to go forward. There's going to be an enormous exchange and circulation of ideas, of entrepreneurial ideas, of new technologies. Uh, and, yet, and yet the issue is, where, where does our country uh, and where do Americans play into that? Not as just traditional uh, customers, clients, 
but rather as generators of ideas, uh, as, as people who will be collaborating. Um, and uh, if we're going to survive economically, we have got to be out there in, uh, in engaging effectively and with trust uh, in all parts of the world, as you say, not just China, but in many, many parts of the world concurrently. So talk about the genesis of the American Councils for International Education and, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. also let's, let's chat about your programs. Thank you. Uh, uh, the American Councils was formed in the 1970s and uh, at a, a kind of a, a, a happy brief time in the early 70s after you'll recall uh, Nixon and Kissinger opened up China right. in 1971 and a year later came to uh, Moscow and signed something called the Brezhnev-Nixon Protocols which made it possible for the first time uh, in, in our long history with that country for um, private organizations, universities uh, and scientific groups to collaborate one-on-one uh, -on -one with their counterparts in the then Soviet Union. The single biggest outcome of that meeting was the creation of the Apollo-Soyuz Joint Space Mission, uh, which to this day uh, informs uh, some of America's most important uh, explorations of space. Uh, and uh, at the same time as the Joint Space Mission, uh, our, our organization, American Councils, was formed uh, in an area that both sides, both the American and the Soviet sides, felt were valuable, and that is the support of the study and teaching of one another's language, that is of American English in Russia, which had not been taught until then, uh, British English was taught, and of the study and teaching of Russian in this country mm -hmm. at the university as well as the high school level. And we had a research agenda, a training agenda, and a curriculum development agenda. Um, and that little window was really all there was for um, exchange, uh, training, and curriculum development outside a very rigidly established intergovernmental quota. Right. And that's sort of where we were born in that time, was, uh, was that ability to, to work and bring together American scholars from many different colleges and universities uh, for, for, for collaboration with um, serious counterparts on the other side. Our uh, inauguration occurred at MIT in 1974 around a conference, uh, and we were initially a consortium of about a dozen uh, schools and universities. Since that time we've grown quite a bit and uh, we remain campus based for about 12 years uh, uh, at Bryn Mawr uh, that you mentioned already kindly and uh, before that at Amherst College and uh, then as the relationship with the Soviet Union under Gorbachev and Reagan began to grow very very quickly uh, we found it um, really essential to relocate our operation here to Washington so we could work more closely with our government funders as well as representatives of the countries themselves. Soon there was not one country the Soviet Union but 15 right. that had, had spread off and um, uh, the programs, the small programs that we had done primarily for training Americans at the most advanced levels in Russian and helping them in their support and their research suddenly had all become bilateral. And for every American we were sending overseas, we, were, we had the ability to host incoming Soviet, post-Soviet, uh, Russian and other uh, uh, students, scholars, teachers, and So the satellite nations, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and then uh, places like uh, Azerbaijan or Armenia, Georgia. Yes. Yes, Central okay. Asia and so forth, Ukraine, right. That suddenly we were dealing with 15 countries and we were dealing with them not in a one-way uh, uh, stream, but in fact in a very large two-way stream. And one of the single biggest changes that happened with the fall of the Soviet Union was the uh, ability of the United States and the willingness of those countries to permit us to conduct open and merit-based competitions right. across that whole region. Uh, that was something that had never been practiced there before, and I would put open and merit-based competitions for fellowship and scholarship programs right up there with free and open elections as one of those sorts of uh, things that, that, that conveys a very strong value uh, to local populations about what matters in America. Now, what's interesting mm -hmm. here is that you have a geopolitical event mm -hmm. um, that is um, between governments mm -hmm. in, in, in mm -hmm. this particular case uh, and, and is, is culturally based. Mm -hmm. um, that then takes a um, form mm -hmm. within a nonprofit mm -hmm. that is not a governmental agency right. but is in part funded by actually both sides yes. in many respects. Yes. Um, and then other geo 
uh, political events go from having it very focused mm -hmm. to then all of a sudden creating mm -hmm. this, um, th this tremendous expansion and mm -hmm. shift mm -hmm. in the model. Um, it's, it's a dialogue mm -hmm. in which the nonprofit as a, as a private entity that can go out of business if it doesn't respond to these stimuli mm -hmm. in an appropriate way, mm -hmm. in a way that will show that the value is still there. Mm -hmm. um, where you're becoming part of the drive. Mm -hmm. And eventually the government side actually goes away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They might continue to fund because there's, there's value there. But the government side no longer is taking this. It's really the nonprofit that is driving this forward. I think you're, I think you're right that the role of the of the nonprofit organization uh, as expert organization was sort of there from the beginning in terms of being a driver, uh, but suddenly or or over time found itself in a close, positive, constructive partnership with governments on both sides. In a sense, we represented a channel for the support of educational programs that otherwise wasn't there, and governments, as you know, public. Uh, public agencies do routinely support education right. in most countries. And since international education is an arm of that, and we were uh, fortunate to have an operational exchange in place that had a great deal of scalability uh, possible in its, in its, in its model. Uh, and the fact that its leadership was expert uh, and focused on a single mission, that is education, uh, rather than being too broadly, uh, but also focused. not mm -hmm. infected by the the government pat patina. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In that, mm -hmm. when you have a government to government situation, everybody has so many political interests. Yes. Whereas, uh, academics are focused in a different way. Uh, they're, they're motivated by different things. So you basically start to separate mm -hmm. the the uh, barriers mm -hmm. to engagement um, by taking a completely different organization and driving that engagement. Uh, uh, I like the way you stated that because my sense that the, as, as good a, a partner as the government can be, uh, governments are driven by policy mandates and imperatives that do shift fairly quickly. Right. Uh, education doesn't work that way. We look at, we look generally, generationally, we're sometimes thought of as being somewhat conservative, but uh, educational culture is, uh, is it can, can also, in fact, be very, very innovative in that sense. And so I think the expert group, the partnership that it formed with the State Department, with the U.S. Department of Education, uh, with the Library of Congress, uh, with, uh, with the National Security Education Program, and other, other government entities that shared some of our values or all of our values uh, made for a strong partnership over time, um, particularly, I would say, supported by our members uh, who are also willing to cost share, to co-finance, because this, this works and uh, this is consistent with their missions as well. And it would be not a complete uh, statement uh, if we didn't also mention the important role of private funders, because the foundations such as the uh, uh, Carnegie Corporation, the MacArthur Foundation, the Ford Foundation, uh, George Soros, and the Open Society Institutes are groups that also share values and, um, in, and understand the importance of bilateral exchange and open flow of ideas, especially with societies that have been traditionally closed. So um, how does your funding uh, generally work uh, mm -hmm. in terms of the proportion that is funded by various um, uh, sources? At the present time, uh, uh, the uh, American Council for International Education conducts overseas fellowship recruitment and alumni support programs for about 5,000 fellows a year. Uh, and we send outbound on our programs, primarily programs for language immersion, but also for field work and research and teaching uh, for about 15, 1,600 Americans. Uh, some of those Americans go overseas for a full year. Uh, and those, as, as you are aware, are some of the most effective programs we have for achieving very high levels of language proficiency. So uh, given, given the, the current balance, which has been pretty much in place for the last 15 years, uh, we're about 75% federally funded from those several agencies mm -hmm. that I mentioned. And the other 25% is privately funded, including from agencies, but also from our university partners and from individual, uh, individual donors as well. Interesting. Where do you go from here? Um, you, you have this 
incredible situation in which in the last decade there has really been a pretty significant shift mm -hmm. in, in uh, some of the realities surrounding uh, society, global society, uh, global economies, mm -hmm. and so on. As you move forward into this next decade, mm -hmm. you, you went through the, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. Now we're at the cusp of another major change. How will that affect the organization going forward? It's a really good question because if in the 70s uh, the, 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 the primary participants in our programs were really area scholars and narrow specialists, I think what we've seen is that globalization has so affected every branch of human knowledge and every aspect of education that, uh, that overseas study is no longer simply the, 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 the province of, of area scholars on the one hand or art history specialists, let's say, from on, on the other. But right now, anyone, whether in science, technology, uh, in business and commerce, in government security or uh, climate change, uh, it's hard to imagine any area that doesn't, in fact, have a global uh, economic mandate uh, in, in, uh, as, as, as they look ahead. Our, our, our goal is to look at the, at the large portions of the globe right now that Americans tend not to know well, often for linguistic reasons, but in some cases just because those regions don't speak English. Right. So you can say that uh, there are parts of the world uh, that are English speaking, and uh, such as England, Canada, Australia, um, and there are other parts of the world, such as Western Europe, that are fairly heavily frequented by Americans. And then there's everything else. Right. The parts of the world that are post-transition, that are post-civil war, that are post-conflict, uh, that are just not well understood by Americans, those are the parts of the globe that we focus on. Not just the former Soviet states, but the Middle East. So you're so. driving into areas where you yourself might be less comfortable and where your history might make you less complacent. Exactly. Uh, we don't go into any part of the world without bringing experts with us first. And so as we began to work in the Middle East, we were very pleased to bring onto our staff some of the leading specialists in the languages and cultures of the Middle East, people with decades of experience. In other words, if, I'm, if Dan Davidson is the, is the person who's worked a lot of time in Russia, then we had to find the Dan Davidson for, uh, for the Middle East. We needed to find the same kind of person who had worked in the Near East. We looked uh, and, and, and we're sure to hire the top people in, uh, in, in Chinese so that uh, because we wouldn't think of going into those areas without the same kind of depth of language, culture, historical, political background uh, to help guide us uh, in, in developing and setting up pro programs. We have nine programs in China right now. We were probably uh, about that many in, in, in North Africa as well as Sub-Saharan Africa today because those are areas of increasing need for the United States. And what's interesting is that we're coming full circle where academic careers, linguistic uh, mm -hmm. uh, careers in linguistics, careers in teaching, mm -hmm. those are the careers that actually set the stage for acad academic success and for economic success um, of the country. Yes. Um, you have a situation in which if people think about their careers a little bit more creatively, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, they actually can not only have a more fulfilling career for themselves, but they can make a material contribution to the success of whole industries, whole sectors, uh, and, and the relationships among people. I completely agree with you that, that today we see 50% of the PhD graduates of our leading, leading graduate schools actually taking those degrees and going into work in the third sector or in think tanks, or in programs like our own, because there are such opportunities there not only to apply your depth, your, your deep knowledge, uh, but also to make a difference in the lives of people, and that makes a big difference. And it all starts with the ability to communicate. Exactly where we started, right? That's absolutely basic to being prepared for work in any, any sphere in the 21st century. Well, Don Davidson, thank you so much for sharing the experience of the American Councils for International Education with us, and thank you for your insights. It was a pleasure. Thank you.